All right. Uh, for today's lecture, let me let me tell you what we are going to attempt to do today, uh, as well as on uh, Thursday. Uh, so I'm uh, in my previous lecture. What I had done is I had described for you uh, what you could expect from the course. Obviously, the requirements for the course. Uh, and then in the second half of the course, I basically went over the syllabus in, uh, in, in you know, pretty substantive detail, uh, discussing each week's readings. Not, not all of the readings in detail, obviously, but just to give you an idea of the over and give you an overview of, uh, the, of the course, the lay of the land, uh, as it were. Uh, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to commence with some, some uh, broad uh, observations and remarks about uh, the subject that we're going to be studying. Uh, what is the distinction between studying India as a nation state and studying India as a civilization? Um, remember, remember, 70 years uh, is a very short period uh, in the history of India, right? Because we're essentially looking at 1947 down to the present day. There's obviously a whole series of very complex questions, such as how much of the Indian past uh, does one really have to know about in order to get some of the nuances of what is happening at the present moment? If, for example, there is a lower class movement uh, of resistance in India, well, uh, its origins might appear to lie in contemporary situations. But we do know that there have been groups of people in India who have been disenfranchised for generations. You know? I mean, it, it would be like studying, let's say, the history of the American Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s and saying that, well, let's just go back to the 1950s. Well, obviously, one would have to have some understanding of the institution of slavery, right? What happened in the Deep South? Um, what happened in the aftermath of the Civil War? Because, of course, I mean, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation 1963, but that didn't free the slaves effectively. Right? I mean, we know what happened in the aftermath of the Emancipation Proclamation. We know that the KKK came into existence. We know that there was a whole uh, regime of lynching that went on for decades. Right? So how much of that would one have to know in order to understand the American Civil Rights Movement? Now, similarly, if you're looking at India post-1947, there are going to be obviously complex questions which we're not going to be able to address in, in substantive detail. I'm going to try to hint at some of them in order to convey to you the idea that some of these uh, questions that we're looking at have a history that goes much further back. But you're not expected to know that history. Uh, and of course, there are elements of that history that I'm not going to know either, because it's a long, convoluted history. And there are you, one of the maps I'm going to show you, one of the things we're going to attempt to do today is we're going to attempt to study uh, a number of things through maps. All right. I mean, there is a whole science of cartography, and uh, there are very interesting aspects to maps because one of the things that happens is that countries occasionally fight what you might describe as a cartographic war with each other. Right? So in 1962, when China invaded India, uh, the maps, and, and what, is, what is that invasion partially about? What is the dispute between India and China over? It's over territory. That's what states usually fight over, isn't it? It's usually territory, particularly if they happen to be adjoining states. Then the dispute is usually over territory. Now the maps that, if you want to look at maps, so let's say China lays claim to a certain portion of India, Arunachal Pradesh is a state, uh, and you want to see, well, what's the history of that? How would you do it? You would look at maps. Well, many of the maps produced prior to 1962 are top secret. I mean, researchers like me have absolutely no access to these maps. And you can't get them either on the Chinese side or on the Indian side. Because one of the things that you would find out is that, well, there is a contested history to this territory, right? A contested history. And at some, po at, at some point, some maps might betray certain things which the state doesn't want you to know. Right? So this is cartography. Now we're going to look at maps that are relatively more innocent. I'm going to point out some of the problems in a couple of these maps uh, when we look at them. But I'm saying all of this by way of a preface because I'm trying to suggest to you that what, one of the things you'll have to bear in mind is that we're beginning really midstream when we begin in 1947 because we're assuming that the independence of India marks a definite watershed. And of course, in, in the common sense, uh, view, it does, because India becomes free of British rule. And as I had pointed out to you myself, I think the principal aspect of the history of the 20th century globally 
is decolonization. If you ask an American political scientist, they'd say the Cold War was the most important aspect of the second half of the 20th century. Right? But the Cold War itself, by the way, has, has an intricate relationship to the whole question of decolonization because there are going to be almost 70 states that are going to become independent in the post-1945 period. Right? Now, that's one set of questions then. How much of India's past do we know? What bearing does that have on our study? Okay. Then there's a question of, well, what do we mean when we really speak of India? To whom does India belong? The India that people lay claim to, well, there are many different Indias here. The, the India of the affluent and the India of the poor might be two very different things. I mean, if you spoke to most villagers in India and you said, well, what is your vision of India? I'm not sure you're really going to get much of an answer. Right? Because that person is probably concerned with his or her immediate livelihood. They're concerned with what's happening in their village. So the word desh, okay, desh means nation. If you asked a middle class Indian, what does the word desh mean? Okay, I'm giving you the transliteration here, desh. A middle class educated Indian would say desh means nation. Well, if you ask a villager, it doesn't mean a nation at all. Desh means your immediate area, your locality, right? The, air, the community, right? Aapka kya desha? What is your country? What is your nation? That's, that's what a middle class Indian would immediately understand it as what is your country? What is your nation? But the idea of belonging to a nation is not an idea that everybody actually really shares in necessarily, right? Then there's this question. So now let's move to a different question. Just laying out the lay of the land. Just some things for you to think about throughout the course before we get into the nitty gritty of what happens in 1947 and of course I'm going to have to give you a little bit of history going back to the coming of the British in India but before we do that here's another kind of question that we want to think about what is it that makes possible the unity of India All right. so one of you on your cards wrote that he or she wanted to know what is the glue that holds together a country called India because there's enormous linguistic diversity in India. I mean in the Los Angeles school district, you know if you go to the LAUSD website and if you read what commentators write about, they'll tell you that there are 160 languages that are spoken in the Los Angeles area. Okay, because of course the United States is preeminently a country of immigrants, which it has been since its inception. Right? However, there's a fundamental difference because in the United States fundamental difference that is between the situation of the United States and the situation of India that we're looking at because in the United States it's also a proven fact that within two generations virtually all immigrants lose their mother tongue right virtually all of them do I mean there are many of you here who are who come from immigrant families and you might be speaking Hindi or Urdu or Gujarati or Bengali or Spanish whatever the case might be you know but if, if you continue to live here, you raise your children here, what is the probability that your children will know Hindi, Gujarati, Bengali, Oriya, Urdu, whatever the case might be? Very minimal. And what is the probability that their children or your grandchildren? Almost zero. Right? I mean, this is effectively a monolingual country. The United States is a monolingual country. Yes, there are large pockets where Spanish is understood and spoken, uh, including, of course, Los Angeles County. Uh, and parts of Texas and so forth and so on but effectively this is a monolingual country and most Americans know only one language now interestingly enough uh, the situation in India is dramatically different because there you do have according to the census of India a thousand spoken languages even today and some of these spoken languages have tens of millions of speakers the constitutional languages of India, such as Hindi, Bengali, all of these have tens of millions of speakers, in some cases well over 100 million. And Bengali, of course, is spoken not just in, in India, but it is the dominant language in Bangladesh, in East Pakistan. Right? So, uh, and uh, 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 something that I'm not going to be able to explain right now, I hope you'll understand the irony of this much later on as we moved along in the course. But I'm going to tell you, suggest to you, that educated Indians, in fact, tend to be 
more monolingual than uneducated Indians, right? Which is, sounds very strange, but if you grow up, for example, as I did, I grew up actually in quite a few places in many different countries, but, but you know, to the extent that I grew up in India, I grew up in, a, in Delhi, and if you grow up in Delhi, you effectively speak only one language at the most two, and that if you happen to be educated and you come from a middle middle class family and are reasonably affluent, right, all of which would more or less describe me, right, and you went to one of the best public schools, public here by the way is the English usage, which means private, in, in, when you say public school in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, as in England it means private school, okay. And so you go to one of these schools, so they are all English medium schools. So if you belong to that sector, you, the first language tends to be very often English. Something that is not commonly understood in the US. Because I've had, I remember when I was an undergraduate at Johns Hopkins University and uh, some professor said to me, where did you learn English? You know, uh, how come you speak English that well? He, t he asked me. And then, of course, I had to explain to him that, well, I'd grown up in India and that, you know, for someone coming from, with my class back background, it was not unusual to know English from a relatively early age. And then the second language would be Hindi. And for those of, those of you who have seen Bollywood films, you know that there's this sort of mix of Hindi and English that is extremely widespread in North India. Now there are lots of people I have encountered, many others have encountered. This is not simply anecdotal, as the, it's anecdotal, but there's actually, I think, a range of literature to suggest that. There are people who are quite uneducated, living in South India, and many of them know four or five languages. They know four or five languages because they live in areas that are, can be viewed as linguistic borderlands, where there are a number of languages that predominate. You know, let's say you work as a tourist guide. You're not even somebody who's got a high school diploma. You work as a tourist guide, you know, you're going to pick up six, seven languages easily. Right? And people of my father's generation, they all knew three, four languages, even though many of them had not even gone to high school. And so there are these interesting problems that we'd have to think about at some point. So when I say the unity of India, well, what's the unity of India? In the United States, one of the things that makes possible the unity of the U.S. is the fact that it's a monolingual country. English is by far the dominant language, and in order to succeed, you really do have to know English. I mean, there are pockets of people who can get by. You often hear stories of people who have lived in Chinatown. Uh, I've met Gujaratis, by the way, here who are in their 70s who frankly know very little English. Okay, but then, you know, I wouldn't describe them as the most spectacular models of success either, the ones I'm speaking about. Okay? In, in order to make some headway in this society, you generally have to know English. I think that that's a, that's a given, right? So one of the things that determines the unity here is obviously the fact that there is a common language. Then there are ideological factors, such as the United States is extraordinarily successful in homogenizing the entire population. You know, whatever your ideology is, you all end up going to Walmart or Costco or Burger King. You know, they're the same damn stores all over the country, no matter where you go. Right? It's a, it's a, the degree of homogenization, the forces of homogenization are extraordinary, which I'm not going to really talk about that at great length, but I'm just giving you an illustration. Right? And then, of course, that's why nation states have such things as national anthems. Right? You're supposed to feel proud, you know, so before a football game, you know, you go to the Rose Bowl, you know, and, you know, 40,000 people there, and you all stand up before the game, and, you know, you all feel patriotic. Well, wh why do we do that? Idea is to foster something called unity. And many Indians, middle class Indians, of course, that's their greatest anxiety, that there's nothing that holds the country together. Well, I personally, my own view is that I don't think the unity is always desirable, but we'd have to discuss the complications of this as we move along. Because this will be a constant theme in the course, right? The fact that there are all of these tendencies which gravitate people in India in numerous, disperse them in numerous directions. It's the linguistic diversity of India, it's a religious diversity. If you look at so-called world religions as they're described, 
that is Christianity, and then within that, of course, Protestantism and Catholicism, Judaism, Islam, that are the Abrahamic faiths. Well, the Abrahamic faiths are not born in India, but, but and then, of course, you've got Confucianism, but a good portion of the world's religions were born in India. Hinduism, of course, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and it's, it's, and it's worthwhile registering this fact immediately, immediately, namely that South Asia has more Muslims than the Middle East today. If you put India, Pakistan, Bangladesh together, the Muslim population of that part of the world is enormous, and it's a very different kind of Islam than what you find in the Middle East. And Christianity, of course, even though it's not born in India, its history in India goes back to the first century of the Christian era, 2,000 years ago. That's when Christianity arrived in India. Right? So you can see what I mean, that there are all these tendencies, and then, of course, you have an institution which is supposed to be unique to India, namely caste. Right? And we'll discuss what the caste system is. But according to the studies that have been done recently, there are over 5,000 caste communities in India. So what, what will hold this country together? And some commentators marvel at the fact that it hasn't broken up already. Because, of course, many people were predicting after 1947, the British being foremost among them, that, well, without us, nothing is going to hold this country together. Right? But now we are obviously in the seventh decade into independence. So these are just some broad considerations and many others, obviously, that I could talk about. But I want you to keep some of these thoughts in mind. And, and as I said, who does India belong to, as it were? You know, how does, there are many Indias. And I think that we'll see that different people have a different degree of investment in the idea of India. Let me rephrase the questions for you in the following way. Do we study India just like we would study any other place? And of course, one answer is that, well, of course we don't, because there are some questions that are particular to the study of a particular civilization or culture. Right? So when we study the history of the Soviet Union or the United States or Britain or France, well, there are certain questions that might be particular to that history, and then there are some questions that might be general, that might be generic. And those questions may have to do with such, such things as, well, how did, how did Germany become Germany? Just as how did India become India? What was the nature of unity over there? We know that, of course, there are historical processes that are extremely different. But then there might be historical processes that might be rather similar or that invite comparison in any case. So the question here is very broadly, do we study India just like we would study another place? On the other hand, I'm suggesting, well, we can't do that. Because, for example, when you study the United States, language cannot be, in my view, one of the principal factors through which one would study the history of the US. Uh, social linguists might disagree and might say that, well, you know, the speech patterns of African Americans might be markedly different, and we know they are than the speech patterns of various other communities. Yes, of course, I'm, I'm quite aware of that fact. Right? But, but speaking of speech patterns and dialects is quite a different thing than speaking about the geopolitics of language and how it operates in a place such as South Asia. All right. So he, these are some broad considerations. Now, um, what I want you to do is I want you to look at a series of maps very briefly. We're not going to discuss all of them, but I want you to have some sense of uh, what is it that we're really speaking about here? So India is a peninsula, of course, and there's a Bay of Bengal over here, and you've got the Arabian Sea there on the, uh, on the left here. Uh, this is Sri Lanka here, and you can see countries such as Bhutan. Maldives is over here. Well, Maldives is, by the way, part of South Asia, but you know, we're not really going to look at that. And here's the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, um, uh, which is uh, a union territory of India. That circle there... Uh, not the one at the extreme top, but below that, that's New Delhi, that's the capital. Uh, it's called New Delhi rather than Delhi. Uh, uh, there is a distinction because New Delhi was a capital that was created by the British. Uh, although Delhi uh, is a city that has a history that goes back to well over a thousand years. Um, and, then, and, and you can see some of the rivers here, so the, the rivers are not marked here, but you've got the Ganges, which is marked over here. So the Ganges originates in the mountains, and then it will flow through the heartland, and it will eventually fall into the Bay of Bengal. 
here. Uh, this is called the gangetic planes, this portion over here. Okay, that's called the gangetic planes. There are some derogatory phrases for it as well. It's also sometimes described as the cow belt, for example, or the saffron belt. Saffron meaning that Hindu nationalists, because Hindu monks who belong to the sort of Hindu extremist views, uh, they tend to wear saffron robes. So sometimes it's described as the saffron belt. Uh, but this is this, so this portion here, uh, let me see if I get, get my, yeah, so here, this is the gangetic belt over here. Okay, and then of course this uh, topographic map gives you some sense of the altitudes because this area in the white here, uh, on the top here, uh, there we're talking about altitudes of 9,000 meters. That's about 27,000 feet. Uh, when you're in, when you're in the 10,000 feet, that's nothing in South Asia, nothing. Because it's not, it's, it's not even really like the lower foothills of the Himalayas. Right? I mean, you, you have to really get up to 20,000 feet. And then, of course, you're talking about, so we're not, you know, the whole Himalayan belt, which goes all the way from Afghanistan to the, to the, to the west over there, from Afghanistan, and then here through, ne through in North India, Kashmir here, Nepal, then you can see Bhutan, and going into Eastern India over here. Um, this constitutes a very distinct region. A, a very, very distinct region, um, a, and partly because the mountains are, in, in a way, a barrier, right? And so you can make a distinction between people in the mountains and people in the plains, right? And one of the, one of the things that you find uh, in the history of colonial India is uh, when the British were in India, remember they, come, they came to a country that, uh, for them, was exceedingly hot. And it is exceedingly hot. Right, so I spent part of my summer in Delhi this year, and the temperature there was 115 every day, every day. When it cools down at night, cools down in quotation marks, it's about 90, 92, okay? And I'm talking about unremitting heat every day, and it can go on for months. It can go on for months. And it's actually gotten worse because of climate change. I know there are people who don't believe in climate change. We won't get into that. But, but there's no question whatsoever, okay, that, 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 that in India, as in many other parts of the world, the weather has changed uh, substantially, um, okay. So uh, that's basically the topography that you have to keep in mind. Now, because you have this huge mountain barrier, there's also a question about whether India went through some periods of, quote, isolation. Now, uh, not necessarily, because of course India is a peninsula, so you have contact through the sea. And, and one of the things that distinguishes the British and the Europeans in general is that what the Europeans do is they bring sea power. So these are seaborne empires. In India, you had classically land-based empires, land-based empires. So with the coming of the, coming of the Portuguese, um, in the late 1400s, 1490s to India, what you have is the inauguration of a new phase of Indian history, which is really marked by the advent of sea power. Right? That's, that's one thing to, to bear in mind. Um, uh, Indian rulers uh, uh, traditionally did not have navies. Uh, there was an exception here in South India. You had a group of uh, people known as the Cholas who had a navy, but, but really that's the exception. The Mughals were by and large, again, a land-based empire. All right, and, and again, we're not looking at all the features, but just to uh, give you a, li a little bit idea here. And here's another um, map. This is more of a political map. Again, you see the peninsula. It marks a few places. Uh, Myanmar to the right here, to the east, okay, all the way to the east over there. M M Myanmar uh, is another interesting problem, as is Afghanistan. I mean, if you look at South Asia, um, Usually, Burma is not included uh, in the study of South Asia. It's included in the study of Southeast Asia. Okay, but again, uh, you know that that's something that one can dispute uh, because Burma was ruled from British India. It was it's really part of the British Indian Empire, uh, and and we know that the Indian immigrants um, essentially uh, flooded large parts of Burma in the 19th century. Uh, the trade was all in the hands of certain Indian castes uh, in, in Myanmar or Burma. And Myanmar is a name given to it more recently uh, by the military regime. Right? And, and 
the other example of a country that poses this kind of problem is Afghanistan, where all the way to the top left there, you can just see a few letters of that word on top of Pakistan. Um, because again, Pakistan is usually, if at all it is studied, which only started happening in the United States, really, after 9-11, right? I mean, you, you'll be astonished to know that when the attacks of September 11th took place, okay, so three, 13 years ago, how many specialists in the entire American establishment, academic, military, state department, all of that establishment knew Pashto, okay? One person. And, and so the United States is now going to go and they're going to launch a war and they're going to try to understand the civilization. Well, it might be useful if you had about 500 people who knew something of the language, for example, right? But that's what I mean when I say monolingual, right? It, 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 it's, it's impossible to make any headway in the U.S. with foreign languages, right? And so, and especially when you're talking about a language called Pashto, which frankly nobody knew. Right? So how are you going to understand that society? How are you going to infiltrate? You want to infiltrate the terrorist networks and you're, you're clueless about what the people are saying. Right? Interesting problem. Think about it. Now, Afghanistan basically fell through the cracks, by which I mean that the South Asianists did not really study, okay, in the United States, Afghanistan, because South Asia really meant India, and then <laughs> Pakistan and Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, right? And the Middle East people said, well, it's too far east. It's way far too east. You know, Middle East means Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and Jordan and countries like that. So essentially, Afghanistan fell through the cracks and nobody really studied Afghanistan. And it's only, as I said, quite recently. So there's an intellectual problem. You see how we divide up the world in certain categories and then some places and certain phenomena don't fit into the categories. And that's a problem of knowledge. Because think about it, that no matter what discipline you study, you use certain categories through which you understand the world. But one of the things about the world is it happens to be an obstinate place. It does not like to fit into the categories that the social scientists create to understand the world. Because what social scientists would really like is, you know, they'd like to have neat categories. So this is a developed world, this is the underdeveloped world. Right? That, those are neat categories. And we know there are problems because, of course, in developed countries, there are large pockets of people who are poor, extremely poor, who don't have health insurance. The infant mortality and maternal mortality rates in certain communities in the United States is almost the same as in Somalia or Ethiopia. And then, of course, there are the super rich in India and Somalia who are as rich as people living in Beverly Hills and even richer, in fact. If you look at real estate prices in India, I mean, you'd be floored, you'd be floored, because you can buy a mansion in LA, and for that amount of price, you'd get an apartment in many parts of Delhi. Seriously, you know? Okay, so, you know, those, we create categories, and so we created categories called South Asia, and then the Middle East. And then what happens if you don't fit into those categories? So, something to bear in mind. Um, and this, of course, is a political map, so it gives you, you know, the main, main cities. Uh, and all of these cities that you see uh, in big, bold letters, I mean, these are all cities with millions of people. We're not talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands here. You know, large towns are hundreds of thousands in India, and then cities are going to be millions. And the huge metropolises, Delhi, New Delhi, which you see on the top there, and there it's distinguished there, um, Delhi is about 20, 21 million. Bombay, now known as Mumbai, is about 20 million. Okay, and Calcutta is here, now known as Kolkata, is about 18 million. Right, and then we have got cities like Hyderabad, Chennai, Bangalore, all of these 5, 10, 15, depending on which city you're talking about. Okay, uh, and one of the, one of the fundamental changes in post-1947 India, which I pointed out before, we're going to look at it in much greater detail before, but now you get an idea because you can see that these huge cities are spread out. One of the fundamental changes then is the migration from the hinterland, that is from the countryside, from rural areas into these large urban metropolitan centers. 
So, so if you had to put it in a slightly different language, the degree of urbanization has changed substantially. Larger parts of the country are getting urbanized. And now, of course, you're speaking about large pockets. Uh, so this is a city here called Pune. This is Mumbai. You can see the distances. We're talking about you know, a couple of hundred kilometers, effectively, right? That this is supposed to now be developed as a huge industrial corridor. Right? A huge industrial corridor because there's going to be immense development all along. Um, and until quite recently, the connectivity, so here these are basically major highways that you see in white over here. Connectivity was very poor in India. Uh, even today, uh, a national highway as it's called, I mean you should try to go down one of these national highways, NH8 for example, which uh, I know very well because it runs by Delhi and then you get into, you get into Jaipur. Jaipur is over here. Okay? Um, I mean the portions of NH8 which are essentially two lanes each direction and you know suddenly you might have to break because there might be a huge herd of cows right in the middle of NH8. Okay? I mean we're not talking about a small provincial country road here. Right? Comparatively. It is a small provincial country road in comparison to, let's say, the 405 or, you know, Interstate 10. Right? But uh, this was a project, the idea of linking all the major cities, this was a project that was really commenced only about 15, 15 years ago in India. And it's still in continuation. All right. It's by no means completed, but of course the connectivity is a lot better now than they used to be, partly because when you have a huge middle class, that means what? Growing consumer demand. Right? Consumption levels. When you have consumption levels grow, then it means what? Huge trucks are going to start coming on the road transporting goods. Right? So uh, this highway system is of relatively recent vintage. Okay. Um, states in Union territory. So this map now shows you the division between what are called the states and the Union territories. Um, the states is what you really should think about. Union territories are very small places. Delhi uh, was a Union territory. It, it's actually a state now. Uh, and, and this, what it does is it gives you sort of the, the division of India by, by states. Uh, one of the things we're going to try to understand later on is how uh, these states were crafted because you'll see a map in a few minutes which will show you that uh, this is post-1947. This is not what India looked like before the partition of India in 1947. All right? uh, and many of these states are going to be what are called linguistic states. That is that there tends to be one language which tends to be the predominant language in that state. It doesn't mean it's the only language that is spoken in that state, but it tends to be the predominant language. All right? um, and here is a map. This is from an extraordinary atlas. Uh, if you ever have the time and the inclination, I mean, it's, it's a one of its kind. It's, uh, it's called the Historical Atlas of South Asia by Schwartzberg. Uh, the library here has a copy. You can't check it out. It's a huge book. Uh, but you can go and take a look at it there, and it's the finest atlas ever put together on South Asia. One of the finest atlases ever put together anywhere, frankly. Uh, and this is a, a map from there which shows you the linguistic families, because not only is there linguistic diversity, but the languages belong to actually different families. So, you know, the languages that are spoken, these languages here, the dark blue that you see over here, okay? Uh, and for those of you who are really alert, you'll notice and it's a fascinating question, how come you have a dark blue over there? Uh, because, because these are the languages that are uh, considered to be Dravidian languages. Okay? That's the family. And so there are four major languages in that group. And, and the subsequent map will, sh will show you, but the, even this one does, the four predominant languages, Dravidian languages, are Telugu. And this is the state of Andhra Pradesh, Canada. Uh, you're not going to get tested on any of this. This is just so that you have an understanding of the material okay, before we launch into it full, uh, full speed. Uh, Canada, which is the predominant language of the state of Karnataka, and then this coastal state here, Kerala, uh, the language here is Malayalam and Tamil, which is uh, the predominant language of the state of Tamil Nadu. Um, and w w one of the reasons why you have this pocket over there is because the theory is that a long time ago, the Dravidians, who were the original inhabitants of, in, of South Asia, 
3,000 years ago, that they eventually moved down, but a pocket of them got left behind. That's one theory, okay? And, and that's why you find that pocket over there, because uh, this here is the Hindi heartland um, in the lighter blue, uh, but again, that's slightly misleading. It simply means that the script is the same for languages such as Marathi and Gujarati. It's a Devnagri script, because the same language, of course, can be written in different scripts very often, right? Uh, scripts and languages are two different things, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and then you've got the Tibeto-Burman languages over here, for example, so forth and so on. Just to give you an idea of what kind of language families we're talking about. And now here, much simpler map, right? To clarify things for you, South Asian language families. So there's this big green that you see, olive kind of green. This is Indo-Aryan languages which are related, of course, to other Indo-European languages as well, right? And then the Dravidian languages, uh, Austro-Asiatic, usually spoken by the tribal populations of India. Tribal populations. And the tribal population of India is very significant. We're talking about, you know, approximately 15%. The word tribal is uh, not to be trifled with. Why? Because, you know, um, you know, for example, uh, let's suppose that you know, I encountered a group of people who were highly educated, but I thought they had the most provincial views. Right? So I might say they're like a tribe to me. You know, the word tribe is almost derogatory. I mean, we speak of American Indian tribes. When, when historians and anthropologists study Africa, they always talk about tribes. You know? Why do they talk, talk about tribes here? Why don't they talk about tribes over here? Right? Except Native Americans, that's indigenous populations as usually viewed as tribes. So there's a politics to that word. It's like, for example, let me give you a, a very simple illustration of a different kind. You know, if you read political commentary, you'll read about Saddam Hussein's regime. Have you ever heard of the phrase the Obama regime or the Reagan regime? No. I always hear Reagan administration, Bush administration. So the governments here are administrations over in that part of the world, they're regimes. Right? See, none of this is innocent. There's always a politics here. And so similarly, you have to be aware of this word tribes. I'm using it advisedly with caution. So one of the words we could use is aboriginal populations. That, that the uh, Austroasiatic languages are usually spoken by people who would be considered to be indigenous people, okay? Or the aboriginal populations. And 15% is well over 200 million. Don't forget the population of India, close to 1.25 billion. So 15% of what you have to always keep in mind because you know, 15% sounds like a small number. No, but when you translate it into real numbers, you're talking about 200 million people, 250 million people. Huge numbers that we're talking about here. Uh, and of course, and the question is, what is their place in the political okay, system? What is their degree of political participation in, in the system? Those are the kinds of questions that will automatically come to mind once you start thinking about these groups of people. All right? But this, as I said, simply gives you an uh, idea of the linguistic, the major linguistic South Asian families that you have. And, and, and here, South Asia does include, so it includes Pakistan, and includes, this is Bangladesh over here. So you notice that Bangladesh, even though it's a sovereign country, because what's the predominant language here? Bengali, which is also spoken across the border in the state of Bengal. Right? Um, and Bengali is, in fact, related to languages such as Hindi, right? So this is why this whole area over here is in this sort of like olive green, um, because this is all part of what you would call the Indo-Aryan language family, all right? And now you have a map which shows you the breakdown. Again, this is not a really detailed breakdown because there are, there are a thousand languages. So you know, you would, you would need minis minuscule detail. But here what it does is it gives you the breakdown in terms of major. So Western Hindi, for example, right? Because there are differences between Western Hindi and other kinds of Hindi. Uh, then your Punjabi there, West Punjab languages, and you see Pakistan there, Pashto, right? If you look to the west over there, right? On top of Pakistan, you see Pashto over there. 
Um, and, and these are the Dravidian languages once again. Marathi speaking here, Gujarati. Gujarati is where is the mother tongue of Narendra Modi, right? The present Prime Minister of India, and the mother tongue of its most famous son, right? Mohandas Gandhi, also known as Mahatma Gandhi, came from Gujarat. As did Muhammad Ali Jinnah, a figure you'll hear about, the founder of Pakistan. Um, in fact, Gandhi and Jinnah grew up in very close proximity to each other. Uh, and here you have, so this is Bengali over here, Assamese, uh, and then there are different scripts. Uh, um, uh, so uh, uh, even though some of the vocabulary might be similar, uh, some of the grammar is going to be dramatically different and then the script is quite different. So as a Hindi speaker, I would not be able to, to read Marathi, okay? Even though if I spent a little bit time with it, I will begin to see the similarities between Marathi and Hindi, just to give you an illustration. And then finally, the last map having to do with languages, if you were to write the predominant languages of each of these states in the script, that's what the map would look like, okay? In the predominant script of that area. Uh, most people here think that these four are identical, they're not. They look quite similar, but they're not. Uh, I mean, there are substantial differences between the four Dravidian languages. Of course, they have a closer relationship to each other than they do to Hindi, let's say. So, so, so uh, Tamil, Tamil would have a closer relationship to Telugu than it would you know, to Gujarati. But nonetheless, they're very, very different languages. And the fact that you know Tamil doesn't mean that you can read uh, Telugu or Kannada or understand it, okay? Now, um, so that sort of give you some idea of the terrain that we are interested in. Now, uh, before we move to this, I wanna set, set up the backdrop. And uh, what we have here is what happens between 1946 and early 1948, uh, 30th January 1948 when Mahatma Gandhi is going to assassinate him. In between, of course, you have the independence of India, the creation of Pakistan. But uh, before we get here, I think I need to spend 10 or 15 minutes uh, to give you a brief capsule roller coast, coaster ride of the history of British India from 1600 to 1946. So you know, what are some of the principal things that you might want to be thinking about? Uh, because the fact that I stand here before you speaking English, which I learned in India, is of course one of the legacies of colonial rule, right? That Eng English came into India, uh, and in fact by um, an act, if I may use that word, it is not the most precise word, but it would take too long to explain the intricacies. By an act of the government of India of 1835, English was going to become the official language of the administration of India. It was not the official language of the administration of India, even though the British had been in India for over 200 years, until 1835. The official language was Persian, which is not an Indian language. Right, so you can see how muddled up things can become. And why Persian? Because before the British, you had the Mughals. In the, the, the empire that, that you had in India was what was called the Mughal Empire. Uh, possibly the grandest empire of its day. Certainly nothing in Europe comparable to the Mughals at that time. So you, the comparisons would have to be with the Ottomans in Turkey, the Safavids in Persia, right? That's where the comparisons would have to be. Now the British come to India in the early 1600s and they come there largely to trade. Right? And that again has a long history. It has a long history because what they were trying to do was they were trying to cut out the middlemen because if you were going to be doing trading with India and what would you, what would you come to India for? You would come to India for such things as spices, for example. Okay? But not only spices. India was the fabled land of textiles all over the world. The textile in industry in India was by far the most developed anywhere. Right? So you come to India for textiles, cotton textiles, silk, muslin. Muslin is a kind of cloth which is so thin that you could take a fabric that goes from this end of the room to the other and you could roll it up and put it in your pocket. Right? Very fine cloth. 
Okay? And so the art of spinning and weaving was extremely well developed. So one of the things that, of course, the British were trying to do as the Portuguese was that you would have to come through the Red Sea and you would have to pay tribute to all the people who were dominant in that region. So in order to avoid having to pay all these middlemen, they wanted a direct trade link with India. Okay? And it hap begins to happen in the early 1600s because Elizabeth, the, the monarch, Elizabeth I, she is going to give a group of men who are merchants a charter, okay, a license to trade in India. And, and thus comes into being something called the East India Company. The East India Company. Now the East India Company, and again this is, I, I, I cannot obviously explain to you because I do a whole course as I think a few of you here know because you've taken it with me, a whole course of the history of British India. Where we essentially look at, you know, how did the British who came to India as traders, how did they end up becoming rulers? Right? You could say, by the way, that that happens all the time, even today. I mean, there are American multinational companies which are enormously powerful, enormously powerful. And for those of you who know the history of the relations between the United States and its backyard, what was its backyard? Latin America, Central America, you know, right? That was its backyard. And the, United, and the U.S. in the 19th century had enormous influence. You know, companies that were basically trading in things like bananas made a huge fortune and would essentially decide the political fortunes of these countries. But here we have a case which is a little different because the East India Company is going to be ruling India from India eventually. And this happens over a period of 150, 200 years because the British come in to India, right? After the charter is granted in 1600, they come to India almost immediately after that. Uh, at this point, India is under Mughal rule. The Mughals are enormously powerful. But the British are going to slowly acquire more rights to trade. And this is how they're going to start to develop their presence in India. Their presence is going to develop largely in the coastal areas. Largely in the coastal areas. Uh, and, and, and in fact, we can actually go back to one of these maps because that will give you a better sense when I talk about coastal areas. So, for example, Bombay here, right, where you see the arrow here, Bombay is essentially founded by the British. And then a place over here just further north called Surat or Bombay, just further north of Bombay, um, right over here, the Surat. And then if you go down s south, east, Chennai, known as Madras. Madras was the name by which it was known in colonial India. And then if you go along the coast, follow the coast all the way up to Calcutta over here, these were the, some of the places where the British were going to establish their presence. And what did they do? They built factories warehouses. Why did they build warehouses? Because one of the things you would do is you would accumulate the goods from the interior, then you would bring them to the port. Because these are ports. The whole idea is if they're coastal, they're ports. And it is from these ports that the ships would then leave. Right? And, and the trade is going to become extremely complicated because uh, China is going to be part of that. Right? And so you're going to have this triangular trade and tea is going to be a big element of it. What's the other big element for those of you who have done Chinese history in the 19th century, late 18th century? Yes, opium. Exactly. And there's, a, and there's a fundamental relationship between the opium wars and the development of the East India Company, uh, uh, becoming, a, uh, becoming a fount of power. Because the opium went from India. It went from India. And one of the reasons it went from India was the East India Company is now in control. They're getting tea, among other things, from China. What do the British have that they can give in return to the, to the Indians and the Chinese? The answer, and it's no exaggeration, is nothing. Nothing. Britain really has almost nothing that is wanted by India and China. One of the things that, so if you look at the East India Company trade from 1600s to 1640, whatever they're taking from India, spices, textiles, okay, in return they have to give bullion. Bullion. Bullion means gold, silver. 
That's all they can give. They tried sending wolves. What got our wolves, wooden clothes, in a country where 90% of the population is living in hot, humid weather? Right? Okay, yes, in the mountains I can, but that's not where they're trading. They don't have any presence way up at 20,000 feet. Right? I mean, they have absolutely nothing at that point in time. And same thing with China. They really don't. So this is where the triangular trade becomes extremely complicated because when, it, when the East India Company begins to rule India, they are going to ship opium from India to China in return for tea from China, for example. And I'm simplifying it. There are other elements of it too. And of course, this is how you're going to end up developing 10 million opium addicts in China, and it's going to eventually lead to the opium wars when the Chinese emperor is going to say, hey, you know, we, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. So there's reason why there's, why there's suspicion, you know, in places like China towards the British and the Americans. I mean, there are histories to all of these things, right? Okay, so I'm giving you fragments here because we're saying we start in the early 1600s. The East India Company is going to slowly, and we're talking about a handful of people in the beginning, hundreds. And mind you, even at the height of British rule in India, there are never more than 150, 200,000 Britishers in India even at the height of British rule. All right? Very few, comparatively speaking. There are far more South Asians today in Britain than there ever were Britishers in India. Okay? And I'm including, I'm, when I say India, I mean undivided India. Anytime I speak of India pre-1947, I'm speaking of undivided India. Obviously, that means it includes Pakistan and Bangladesh. Right? Okay, so... Then, th latter part of the 1600s, early 1700s, the company slowly is going to begin to acquire powers. One of the ways it in uh, acquires powers is that it's going to enter into alliances with Indian rulers. Because this is where the question of unity of India comes in. Now you've got enormous linguistic diversity. You're, you're the emperor. You're sitting in a place called Delhi. You're, you're fluent in Persian and Turkish, let's say. Right? Why should an Englishman speaking English or a Frenchman speaking French be any more or less a foreigner than somebody coming from here who, spe who speaks Tamil? If you're sitting up in North India, right? So the idea of a foreigner is something that we'd have to look at. Because one question that comes up is how did India fall under British rule. How did this gigantic country with such a huge population fall under the rule of the British? Right? And of course, Indian for Indian nationalists in the 19th century, this was the preeminent question. You know, why did we allow ourselves to be enslaved by the British? Right? You know, didn't we eat enough beef? You know, we just weren't, didn't have muscles. Right? We couldn't compete with them. Were they a more masculine people? Did they have better administrative machinery? Did they have better technology? For example, no historian in the world, not one historian in the world would say that the British had better technology than the Indians in the 17th century. Not at all. In China and India accounted for half of the world's trade in 1700. Half of the world's trade was accounted for, if not more, by China and India alone. Right? China, India, and Europe, all the way until 1750, roughly account, roughly, for about one third of the world's trade each. You know, leave out about 5-10%, which is the rest of the world put together. And, and they're concrete, there are they're quite a lot of studies that have shown that. All right? So, given this situation, the question for Indian nationalists is going to be, well, how did India fall under British rule? Is it because we were not united as a people? Right? And so I gave you an illustration. Is it because, for example, that if you're sitting as an emperor there, right, and, and you're not even conversant with any Indian language because the Mughals were basically Persia, Persian Turkish origin, if I may put it this way, right? And they're speaking the language of the aristocratic elite here now that they brought with them. Um, why, wh wh under what circumstances would they think of a speaker of English or French as any more foreign than the speaker of Tamil or Telugu or Bengali or Oriya, whatever the case may be? But of course, if you took that point of view, then 
the question would be, well, was there never other kinds of unity in India? Why, is, why are the same gods, the pan-Indian gods like Vishnu and Shiva, they were worshipped all over India. So there was some notion of unity that came, came out of the Indian past. Right? We won't be able to resolve that question because then we're going to have to revisit the whole Indian past and that's going to be a different course. But the, the gist of what you have to keep in mind is that that the English come as traders, they slowly expand their presence, beginning with the coastal regions, then moving into the interior. By the late 1600s, early 1700s, they're beginning to forge alliances with Indians, rulers, because India is going to be fragmented, right? And the lines of fragmentation are enormous. You know, they're obviously political, they're linguistic and so on and so forth. And by the mid 18th century, by the 1700s, mid 1700s, 1757 is, a, is the date that is classically put forward when there's a little battle called the Battle of Plassey. And at this Battle of Plassey, an English uh, uh, general, uh, military man by the name of Clive, he is going to defeat an Indian ruler, right? Uh, and this, the Battle of Plassey, 1757, this is usually conventionally viewed as the beginnings of British rule in India. Not the British presence in India, which is earlier, as I've already mentioned to you, but the beginnings of British rule in India. Right? And over the course of the next half a century, the British are going to, of course, wage wars of expansion. They're going to wage wars of expansion because they're going to try to merge more and more territories into their territory, which is going to be called British India. Right? Their possessions are going to be known eventually as British India. And certainly by 1800, early 1800s, we can say that the British have become unquestionably what is called the paramount power, right? the paramount, the supreme power. There's going to be, there's going to be a whole series of rebellions, scattered rebellions here and there, various forms of resistance to British rule, the most concerted such of such efforts is going to be in 1857. It's known as the Great Rebellion of 1857-58, when British rule is going to be shaken to its foundation. It, it looks like it's almost going to collapse, but, but they're going to stage a recovery, a remarkable recovery, uh, and they're going to be able to secure India. And what's going to happen in 1857-1858, after, the, after they're able to crush the rebellion, is that the company, the East India Company, is going to be abolished. And India will now directly become a, what's called a crown colony. So it's going to be ruled directly from Britain. Of course, the company had already started losing many of its powers by the early 1800s. Because as the company, because remember, the East India Company, plus, for example, Clive, who is employing him? It's not something called the government of Great Britain. No, it's the East India Company. He's an employee of the East India Company. And the East India Company has its own armies. Right? So the East India Company is going to become a source of power, which is going to become something that is going to bother the British back in England. Because Parliament, because if you, you know what the, what the British political system is, right? I mean, you have a monarch, as you do today, right? Elizabeth II. Right? And she's been monarch for God knows how many decades. Uh, I think her older son's waiting eagerly for her to pop off so he can at least become king for a few years. God knows that that's going to happen. But in the event, I mean, so you have the monarch. But the monarch, of course, is, a, is not the source of power as such. Right? There's a difference between the head of government and the head of state. And then you have, of course, the prime minister, who is the one who wields the power. And you have a parliamentary system. You have a cabinet, as you do over here, a cabinet. Right? So now in the 19th century, as the company in the late beginning, going back to the late 18th century, early 19th century, as a company starts to become really powerful, there are people back in Britain who are starting to worry. Because the company is becoming an alternate source of power. And you know, one of the things that happened, just to give you an illustration of why there's so much anxiety about the company, 
is that people acquire enormous fortunes, the people working for the company. I'll give you a dramatic illustration. I'm sure none of you has heard of it, although you've heard of the university. Yale, one of the most famous American universities. Well, if it's named after a man called Elihu Yale, who was the principal donor. But Elihu, Elihu Yale was also the governor of Madras. That's where he made his fortune. He made his fortune in Madras. So people like him, they're going to leave India with enormous fortunes. And most of them, of course, go back to Britain. And the aristocratic elite in Britain gets really worried because many of these people are making their fortunes. These are people who came from the lower end of British society. Right? These are people who couldn't do anything back in England, so they join the company, they go to India, then they make an enormous fortune there. Then they come back to Britain and they attempt to secure political power. They try to buy seats in the House of Commons. You could do that commonly. Right? So, so this becomes a source of anxiety. So there are attempts to control the company all the way from the late 18th century moving into the 19th century. And by the 18th 20s, 1830s, a company has really ceased to be an effective power. So when we say that in 1857-58 the company was abolished, well that's technically true, but the company had ceased to become a force because by the 1820s India is really being governed more or less directly in many fundamental respects by Britain itself. That is that there's enormous supervision from London as to how India is going to be ruled. Okay. Now, then you have the rebellion of 1857-58, and that is going to usher the aftermath of that because the rebellion is going to be crushed, and in the aftermath of that, the British are going to try to usher in what they call progress and improvement. You know, let the dust settle down. The queen, this is Victoria. The queen at that time, the British monarch is Victoria. The queen is going to basically say that, look, there's been a lot of bad blood that has flown between you know, the people of India and the people of Britain, but now that this rebellion is behind us, you know, let's try to see if we can work together, right? I'm going to accept all the Indians as my subjects. So Victoria is not just Queen of England, she's eventually going to become the Empress of India. That's going to be one of the titles that's going to be added, okay, to her designation. So she becomes Empress of India eventually. And during the 1860s, 70s, 80s, 90s, what you're really going to have is you're going to have social reform movements, you're going to have the creation of modern universities, right? That's essentially what's going to take place. In 1885, an organization is going to be founded known as the Indian National Congress. Very often abbreviated as INC in the histories most often simply referred to as the Congress. What is the Indian National Congress? It's a group of Indian men. At this point, they're only men involved in politics in India, as, it, as is the case, of course, all over the world. They're going to come together and they're going to say, hey, we want to have some role in the administration of our country. This happens to be our country, but we don't have any hand. Right? So in other words, what's the, what's the other word? It's the beginning of nationalism right nationalism some nationalist sentiment home rule right some nationalists but but we're not saying that in 1885 these five or six dozen men mainly lawyers who came together that they were inspired by the desire to have an independent India no they're not thinking of that what they're thinking of is well we want a greater role for Indians in the administration of our own country so uh, how do you acquire a greater role? Illustration. The Indian Civil Service. The Indian Civil Service, so like in the United States, you know you have a civil service, right? I mean, if you want to join, if you want to join the bu bureaucracy, you enter the civil services. So then you have what is called the Indian Civil Services. They're also called the heaven-born. Because the Indian Civil Service is very small, very select. And, you know, you could be a young Englishman in your early 20s, mid 20s, and suddenly you find yourself the ruler of a province with one million people. Happened all the time. 
and you don't even know any Indian language, but you've got 50 servants and you know interpreters and translators, right? So that's the Indian civil service. Now, if an Indian wanted to join the Indian civil service, they couldn't. It was only for the English. Eventually, when they allow the Indians to join the Indian civil service, guess, guess what? You have to take the exam in London. So you're an Indian, you're sitting in, you know, Pune or Madras or wherever. You want to join the Indian civil service because you say, hey, I want to be able to help in ruling and governing my own country. Well, in order to do that, you have to first go to England to take the exam. So what the Indian National Congress is, is it's an organization which is going to say that, well, there are some injustices that we need to correct. We need to give Indians greater representation. They should be able to speak in their own voice, etc., etc. I think you get the picture. And what is the modus operandi? The modus operandi is petitions, right? Petitions. You write a petition. Your Excellency, you know, would you please consider doing such and such thing? Right? That's a petition. You go as a delegation. Ten of you go there and you lay a petition before the Governor General. The ruler of India is called the Governor General. He's also called the Viceroy. So this is what the Indian National Congress is going to do. Of course, within a few years of its creation, within a decade or two, the Indians are going to say, this is all humbug. This is not going to get us anywhere. And what you're going to have is you're going to have full-blown nationalism that's going to start to emerge. Right? Now, that has a long, complicated history, as you can expect. We're not interested in the entire history of Indian nationalism here. What we want to do is we want to move on to the early 20th century and to the emergence of M.K. Gandhi. Okay, um, otherwise known as Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma is not his name. Let me, let me emphasize that. Mahatma is a title. It's an honorific. It means the great soul. Okay, the great soul. Mahatma, it's made up of two Sanskrit words. Uh, there's a process in, San, uh, in Sanskrit, it's called Sandhi, which means when you combine two words here. So Maha means great and Atma means soul. Okay, the great soul. So this is a title that's going to be conferred on him. So M.K. Gandhi is born in 1869 in, in Gujarat, over here. He's born in this little town here, which you can't really see here, it's called Porbandar. Okay, that's where he's born in 1869. And Gandhi is going to, like all Indians of his generation who had political aspirations, what is he going to do? He's going to go to England and he's going to get credentialed in law. He's going to eventually come back to India, spend a year in India, and then he's going to go to South Africa. And he's going to spend over 20 years in South Africa. Right? And that's a critical part of the history not just of Gandhi, it's a critical part of the history of South Africa, mind you. Okay? I mean, if you're studying South African history and you're trying to understand the anti-apartheid movement, okay? you know, the fact that Gandhi was there has enormous impact. But, but we, we're not going to be doing the history of South Africa here for the moment. The crucial thing, nonetheless, is that Gandhi spends over 20 years, and this is where he is going to first test out his ideas about mass non-violent resistance. Okay? Mass non-violent resistance. He coins the word, it's called Satyagra. All right, Satyagra and the word, this is again, this is a word that is really a word that he coins. The word Satya means truth and Agraha means force. You confront your opponent with the force of truth. Right? And I think there's no question that Gandhi is someone who comes up with something entirely novel in the history of politics as was known until that time. It's not to say that the idea of non-violence as such is unique to him. In fact, for those of you who know your New Testament, and if you know Matthew, and in particular the Sermon on the Mount, right? or if you know, let's say, Henry David Thoreau's essay on the duty of civil disobedience, you know that there are people who obviously have thought about the idea of nonviolence. 
But what he did was he took the idea of non-violence simply as a matter of individual conscience and he raised it to become a part of the ethic of a collectivity. Right? It's not simply an individual now as was the case with Henry David Thoreau. I don't know how many of you know that essay, that famous essay which I think in most American high schools you still have to read at some point on the duty of civil disobedience. When Thoreau said that, well, I'm not going to pay my taxes to a state because these taxes are being used to support an illegal war. And so instead he went to jail. And then he wrote an essay called On the Duty of Civil Disobedience. Right? But Thoreau's thinking of individual resistance, that if something doesn't agree with my moral conscience, then I'm not going to do it. Right? What Gandhi is going to do is he's going to take, he's going to use the idea of non-violent resistance, he's, he's going to develop it for a collectivity. And one of the fundamental transformations that's going to help in putting Indian nationalism on a very different trajectory is that when Gandhi returns to India in early 1915, after having spent over 20 years in South Africa, Gandhi is going to transform the Indian National Congress into a mass organization. And when I say mass organization, I'm talking about millions of people who are going to pay dues. Okay? Membership fees. It becomes a mass organization. At its height, the Congress had more members in the 1920s than the Communist Party of China. So this is, and Gandhi plays again a critical role. Now, there are obviously histories that contest what Gandhi's role is. They like to emphasize the role of people who used armed violence in India. And we're not going to try to settle that question here, although to my mind it's just unequivocally clear that by far the greatest figure in the history of Indian nationalism is Gandhi. There's just no comparison, even remotely, I think. But as I said, we're not interested in settling that question. What we're interested in is now simply taking the narrative to the 1940s to set it up so that you can understand what's going to be happening. So 1939 is the beginning of World War II. Now when World War II commenced, the Congress party under the leadership of Gandhi took the decision. It took the decision that it was going to be neutral in this conflict. And I use that word with deliberation. Because you have to think of it this way. And again, I'm simplifying. Since we can't really look at all the nuances of the arguments that are implicated here. But if you had to look at it in the crudest terms, the view that the Congress took was that deplorable as is fascism and Nazism, because when, of course, 1939, outbreak of World War II, it means that what it does is it sets up Britain and its allies. The United States is not in the war, as you know, at that point in time. It's going to come into the war much later on, after the attack on Pearl Harbor. So Britain and its allies are set up as the democratic forces opposed to totalitarianism and fascism, represented, of course, by Germany, preeminently, and then to some degree by Italy, and then, of course, by Japan on the Pacific front. The view of the Congress is that, yes, totalitarianism is deplorable. Fascism is to be condemned, but so is imperialism. So is imperialism. Why should we, as a colonized people, distinguish between the imperialism of the British and the fascism of the Nazis? Right. Putting it in crude terms. And so the Congress, and of course, the, because you remember that 1939, by now I haven't gone through, obviously, all the campaigns of resistance that launched by the Congress under Gandhi and others over the course of the last two decades. But the demand for Indian independence had been mushrooming, growing, and was becoming, of course, irresistible, almost. So in 1939, when war broke out, essentially the Congress took the view that, well, look, you know, we're not going to support British efforts in the war because as far as we are concerned, Britain itself is close to being a fascist power. It's certainly an imperialist power, so why should we distinguish? And so the Congress position was a position of neutrality. 
And this is important. Now, it's important for the following reason. That the Indian National Congress was not the only political party or political organization representing the interests of Indians at this point in time. In 1885, when it was founded, it was the first organization of its kind, and it remained the only organization of its kind for some time. But by the early 20th century, the Muslims of India, some of them, had been persuaded to believe that the Congress would not represent their interests. Right? So to some of the Muslims it was represented that the Congress was essentially a Hindu organization. And so of course the fear that was put into many Muslims was, well what happens if Indian nationalism becomes successful and the Indians are able to throw out the British and it once again sovereignty falls back on the Indians, but the Indians are divided themselves. They're Hindus, they're Muslims, Sikhs, so forth and so on. And so the fear that is put into Muslims is that, well, in a country that is predominantly Hindu, you are not going to get adequate rights. You're going to be treated as second-class citizens. And we know now, I mean, this was not something that was known in 1909, really, but we know for the last several decades that one of the things that the British did was they promoted this idea that the Hindus and Muslims have completely different interests. Right? You know, there's a, there's a phrase that is used in common English. I'm sure you all know that. Divide and rule. Right? And of course it's simplistic, but there are elements of that. There's no question. And so in 1909, for example, there's an organization that is going to be founded. It's called the Muslim League. Okay, the Muslim League. That's the name of the organization. You can tell from the name itself. Right? And the Muslim League is founded because the Viceroy, that is the Governor General of India, he calls his Muslim leaders in private meeting, secret meeting at that point, and tells them, you know, your interests are not going to be represented by the Hindus. The Congress is not a secular organization. And so, in 1909, the Muslim League is going to be founded. However, it is a telling fact that as late as 1937, right, just before the beginning of World War II, as late as 1937 when they had provincial elections in India. Okay, so these provincial elections take place to give, because there's some degree of autonomy. So, so nationalism has now eventually come to the point where the, you have some degree of autonomy in domestic matters. And as late as 1937, the elections that are conducted that year, even in areas that are Muslim majority, and I will explain that to you in greater detail in my next lecture, even in those areas, the Congress is going to win all the seats. In other words, as late as 1937, the Muslim masses are not persuaded that their interests and the interests of the Hindu masses are different. Okay, this is the situation. We're going to stop here and we're going to resume this narrative on Thursday and we will certainly come up to not just 1947 but to the assassination of Gandhi in 1949.